did someone leave this here a few weeks ago? Because it's from the end of days distillery. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, we weren't sure. And I was like, man, we got it. This is a nice cup. Want to make sure. Yeah. There you go. End of days. All right. It's perfect. All right. Um, hey, welcome. My name is Adam, uh, lead pastor here. I need to just correct something. It's not Brian's fault, um, but the wrong slide was up again because that's just, I'm not perfect, okay? Um, the membership classes are the 28th and February 3rd, all right? So the dates were on the slide were 20th to 28th. We pushed it a week because we got a busy January in other ministry areas. So just so you all know, 28th and 3rd. Um, it's in your email and there's a link there to sign up, but not your fault, man. I put the wrong one in there. I'm sorry. I was, I was testing you. Yeah. All right. Hey, we're in Mark 13. and um, or, Yeah, Mark 13. And we have a continuation of what Jesus started to address last week. Um, the disciples had asked him how they were going to know that the end was coming. And Jesus looked at the temple in Jerusalem and said, not one stone will be left on top of another. Um, and they assumed that meant that the end of days was, um, was during that time. And so they said, well, how, how are we going to know that? How will we know that the end is here, that the end is coming, all right? Jesus says, well, we'll see wars and rumors of wars. We'll see earthquakes. We'll see famines. But that's just the beginning. Um, that's just the beginning of the birth pains. And so right now, where we live, we are in the beginnings um, or somewhere in the middle. I, no, no one knows, but we're 2,000 years in, okay? Um, but there, we're in the beginnings of the birth pains with what we see going on in our world. Um, but it's an extended period of time. That's Jesus' point. There's, there's an extended period of time. Don't be scared. Uh, don't fear. Persecution will come. Stand strong. Um, but then Jesus transitions today into a specific moment of time that marks a, a very specific timeline of the end. So while the first little part is kind of a continuous long period of time, now we have this moment that really kind of ushers in the last few years before Jesus returns. And so we're going to see that in Mark 13, 14 through 23. Um, so we're going to go ahead and read this in its entirety. Um, 13, 14 starts with but, all right, but when you see. So what Jesus said Right in chapter, or in verse 13, is you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures till the end will be saved. So stand strong, endure persecution, fight for the faith, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who was on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. And never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. So we can kind of break up our passage this morning into two different sections. We have what's called the abomination of desolation. And then we have what Jesus referred to as the tribulation. Um, actually, it's going to be called the great tribulation. So the tribulation period, we'll get to this, is a longer period. The great tribulation is half of that. Um, but these are our two sections. I want us to really get a better understanding of, um, really understanding of what Jesus is, is referring to. And this is, this is important for us um, to dive in at times to prophecy, and, and it can be hard to digest, it can be hard to understand. In fact, this passage is one of the most debated uh, amongst end times theologians. There's so many different ideas about exactly when and, and the timing of all of this. And so we have to be careful again, like we said last week, to, to just pull out what we see is clear from Jesus. Not to dig in deep and try to come up with our own ideas, but what does Jesus say very clearly is going to happen? And let's just be confident in that. But it's important that we study these things, one, so that we can be ready, so we can be readying our hearts and minds, so that we can, um, you know, stand firm in our faith as these things maybe might come in our lifetime. Also, we want to we wanna have a sense of urgency in the way that we live our life. If these things are true that Jesus is talking about, then there are going to be people that don't know Jesus who have to face judgment at a certain time, and we need to be 
urgent in our carrying of the gospel, in our living on mission, in how we, how we live our lives and how we share with our neighbors and our coworkers and even our family members that don't know Christ. And so it's important that we slow down sometimes, even in the hard passages, to understand. Now, we are going to jump around in Scripture a little bit because I, I want us to have a better understanding of what Jesus is talking about. But let's talk first of the abomination of desolation. It sounds so bad. The abomination of desolation. It's like a, a, like a movie, which it really is bad, which is why it sounds like that. But Daniel, in his prophetic book, addresses this. He addresses a lot of end times prophecy. But in chapter 9, he talks about the abomination of desolation. And this is what he says in verse 27. I think I'll have it on the screen for you guys so you don't have to turn there. Here's what Daniel says. And he, talking about um, this person who will, who will make this happen, um, shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolation, okay, or the desolator. Now that sounds um, like a lot. So here's kind of what he's saying, okay. The time that is prophesied by Daniel is one week, which is seven days. But if you take that um, in how he writes the rest of it in Hebrew, it refers to seven years. This is where we get the idea that the tribulation is a seven-year period of time. He says, for one week he will make a strong covenant, this person. For half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice. So half of seven years is three and a half years. So for half of the, of the time, there will be an end put to sacrifices and offerings in the temple. There will be great abominations that take place, so much so that the temple will become desolate. The Jewish wor worshipers will flee. They will run from the temple. There will be nobody there. It will be a desolate place. So this person who we'll see is referred to as the, as the Antichrist later on by Paul will, will do something that will be such an abomination that people will, will create a, a desolate place in the temple. And this happens, Daniel says, halfway through this seven-year period. Daniel 12, 11 says, from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days, which is, if you do the math, is roughly three and a half years. So um, we, can, we can take this prophecy, and, and we'll kind of do some bullet points to, to clarify a little bit. We take these prophecies about this tribulation period, about the abomination of desolation, the timing of it all. And then we take what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Um, we can really start to get a better picture of what this event is going to be. Paul refers to this man as the man of lawlessness. He refers to him as the son of destruction. Um, and we refer to him as Antichrist. There will be a lot of Antichrists, Jesus tells us, but there is one who is kind of the greatest of them all, that will do all these crazy things. He'll, he'll have a covenant with 10 different nations, and then he'll actually break covenant with three of them, but that's all for another time in Daniel. But there's this man who, who kind of creates this sense of peace for people, and then three and a half years into his, his kind of reign, he will take it up a notch. He'll cancel all of the sacrifices and offerings, and he will, what Paul says in verse 4, um, exalt himself so that his seat in the temple, he'll take his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming to be God. So you have this Antichrist, three and a half years in, will come into the temple. This is the great abomination. There are more that he, he will do. But he will take his seat in the temple, and he will claim that he is God. He will say, I am the one to be worshipped. I'm the one you should follow. Let me take my seat in the place of God, in the temple, and that will cause everyone to flee. So this is what we have, all right? So let's, let's kind of narrow it down into bullet points. Let's make it a little bit more easier to digest, all right? We have Daniel. We have 2 Thessalonians. Here's a few things that we know to be true, right? We want to focus on what we know. The abomination of desolation is the act of the Antichrist sitting down in the temple and claiming to be God. That's what Jesus is referring, is referring to in Mark 13. The abomination of desolation. In fact, he, Jesus uses the word he, so he's referring to a person. We know that this happens three and a half years into the tribulation period. And we know that he will put an end to daily sacrifices and offerings, which means that at some point in history, they will be reinstated by the Jewish people. We also know 
because he's going to take a seat in the temple, we know that there must be another temple built. We know that has to be true. In 63 BC, the Romans took over the land of Israel. From that point until 1948, about 2,000 years, the nation of Israel was ruled by somebody else. They didn't have independence or freedom for 2,000 years. Um, the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and from that point on, there has not been another temple rebuilt. In the place of the temple is, is what's called the Temple Mount, and on that site, there are two Islamic structures. There's the Dome of the Rock, and there's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So on the site where the temple will one day be rebuilt, there are two um, Islamic worship sites. This is the location where the third temple will be built, and this is why there's so much tension and conflict between Muslims and Jewish people in Jerusalem. This is really the root of all of it. When, when um, the Muslims came in and they kind of had their reign for a time, um, this, was a, this was something that they kind of took over. And then in the agreement, when Israel was given back the land, the agreement was is that uh, the Muslims would keep this sacred um, spot. And so conflict. This is why when we hear news of conflict in the Middle East, so many people who are, are like end times um, enthusiasts and like theologians, they love this, this end times prophecy stuff and they love reading it. Um, whenever there's something that happens, it's such a massive deal. And it should be to us as Christians as well, because we know that before Jesus comes back, there must be a temple rebuilt on that site. And so when there's conflict there, our ears perk up, well, what's going to happen? Will they somehow get possession of that, that place again? Will they reclaim that spot? I mean, that's, you talk about a, a massive conflict that has to happen for them to tear down these two holy sites of Islam. But this has to happen before Jesus comes back, all right? So we know that to be true. We see this in, in both Daniel and in um, 2 Thessalonians, all right? So, so we know that to be true. Now, last week, we learned that before the end of the age takes place, as Jesus refers to it, um, all nations must have the opportunity to hear the gospel, right? Jesus says all people must hear first. So we know that that hasn't happened yet. This morning, we also see that a temple must be rebuilt in order for these things to take place, okay? So we can have some clarity there. We know that these things must happen before Jesus returns. All right, so simply put, the abomination of desolation is, is an event that takes place three and a half years into the tribulation in which the Antichrist will do away with sacrifices and offerings, he'll take a seat in the temple, and he'll demand to be worshipped as God. This will cause the Jewish worshippers to flee, leaving the temple desolate. And after this, there will be three and a half more years, years that will be worse than anything ever experienced on the earth. And then things change a bit here from Jesus, right? His, his, uh, his language of urgency kind of changes. Prior to this, right, I, I kind of mentioned this, when he talked about persecution, he said, stand firm. Be strong, right? Know what you believe, but also rely on the Holy Spirit to give you the words to speak. Don't run from persecution. Don't run when you're arrested. Don't run when you face, you know, any kind of oppression because of your faith. But stand firm and know what, you, you know, know what is true. And then call on the Holy Spirit to give you the words to speak. Don't rely on your own knowledge when you start talking, but rely on the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say. But now, Jesus says, if you live anywhere near the temple, run. Like, run as fast as as you can. Flee to the mountains. If you're on your roof and, and you see or hear of this happening, don't go and pack your things. Run as quickly as you can. If you're working the fields, don't go back for your jacket. Run as quickly as you can. If you're pregnant or you're, or you're a nursing mother, you're going to have great difficulty surviving this time. Pray that it doesn't happen in the coldest months of the year. Why? Because look again at what, what verse 19 says in Mark uh, 13. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. Run, because it's going to be worse than anything that has ever happened on the face of the planet in the history of mankind. All right, So this is what we're going to call the Great Tribulation. Let's talk about this time. We have the abomination, now we have the Great Tribulation. There are two different terms that we need to understand here. First is the Tribulation. And second is the great tribulation. There's a, there's a distinction between the two. We already saw in Daniel chapter 9 that the tribulation period will last seven years. 
Then Jesus says in Mark 13 that an even worse tribulation will start at the abomination. So there is distinction between the two. In fact, in Matthew 24, um, in his account of, of this story, Jesus himself calls it a great tribulation. So we can title it that as well. The great tribulation is understood to be the second half of the tribulation period because things get even worse. Now, we're not going to get into the book of Revelation this morning, um, but during this time period, Revelation does tell us that the judgment of God will intensify. So not only are there the natural disasters and not only is God kind of causing that to happen, but God is also raining down judgment on the people. Not only that, but also Satan has ramped up his attacks and his attempts at gathering people and, and deceiving those who believe. And we see that nothing like it has ever happened in the history of mankind. In, in uh, historical commentary um, that I read this week, he mentions that in 1343, the bubonic plague started to sweep across Europe. And over eight years, just eight years, two-thirds of the population of Europe was afflicted by the plague. And out of those two-thirds, one half died. They say an incredible total of 25 million people died in just eight years from that plague. This coming time of tribulation will be worse than that. And in the same commentary, the author quotes, I, don't, I can't even say this name, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Okay, some guy. He wrote a book called Out of Control, Global Turmoil on the Eve of the 21st Century. He wrote this in 1993. And he sets the number of lives deliberately extinguished by politically motivated carnage at between 167 and 175 million people. So over our history, nearly 175 million people have been killed by politically motivated, um, I guess, pursuits. Most other st statisticians would, would give you the same estimates, but here's the point, right? The tribulation is going to be worse. Things that we've seen in our history, um, you know, you think of the worst thing in our history. I'm sure, you know, many of us think of World War II. Um, it's going to be worse. Right, you think about the, the floods that I mentioned in China in the early 1900s that killed like 9 or 10 million. It's going to be worse. It's no wonder that Jesus tells those that live in that surrounding area to run as fast as you can, as far away um, as you can. It will be so bad, in fact, that the Lord himself has to cut it short, what Jesus tells us. If, if he let it go on, then nobody would survive. Not one human being would be left standing because it's going to be so terrible. So God himself has to cut it short at three and a half years. But why does he do that? It says he does that for the sake of the elect, for the sake of those who believe. Now, I don't want to confuse things this morning and get into the deep theology and the debate behind election, predestination, free will, all of that. That's not where we're going, okay? We're going to define election simply as those who have been chosen, okay, it's going to be hard. Um, there, it, there, it's, the literal translation of the Greek is the called out ones, okay? Those who have been called out to believe, the chosen ones, right? So those who have placed their faith, faith in Jesus, the chosen ones, the Christians, for their sake, God will shorten the days of the great tribu tribulation. Well, what does that tell us also? It also tells us that Christians will be alive during the tribulation period. So it's going to be so bad that he has to cut it short for the sake of the elect. If, um, if, it got, if he didn't shorten it, then, I mean, they would still go to heaven, but they would have to face really, really bad things. All right, now, how does he do that? You're going to have to wait till next week because our next passage is the coming of Christ. But that's how he cuts it short. Three and a half years after the great tribulation begins, um, you can just read the title of the next one, right? Verse 24, the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be a great message. But he's going to come back, and he will, um, we'll get into the theology next week, but he's going to establish some things, and then there will be another period of time before he completely uh, obliterates the devil. But that's what cuts it short, the coming of Jesus. So, salvation comes for those who have endured those three and a half years. What else will be true in the great tribulation? What else do we see in scripture that we know to be true in verses 21 and 22? If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. 
So what else do we know to be true during this time is that there will be a great deception that occurs. Again, while God's wrath is being poured out, we have these natural disasters that are just horrible. Satan will be enacting an even greater deception than he is right now. He will use men and women to draw people away from the Lord. They will perform, we don't know how, signs and wonders, probably because of evil spirits, but they're going to perform signs and wonders, things that are going to convince people that they are being used by God. Follow us, follow him, right? Follow this man who has claimed to be God. He is. Look what he's given us the power to do. And they're going to do these things to deceive and to lead people astray. But I love how Jesus says it, right? If possible, lead them astray. Right? Doesn't mean it's guaranteed, but he's saying there's going to be some who are so strong that those, those attempts on their life, those attempts to lead them astray are not going to work. It's not going to be possible for many people. But there's going to be this, this massive, like, spiritual warfare that's happening at the same time of all of these other terrible things that are happening in the world. It's going to be, I mean, a time that we can't even fathom how bad it is. But why not focus the attention on those who don't believe, right? Why is the intent to draw those away who believe? Because those who don't believe, they don't need to spend their time on them. They don't believe, right? But they're going to be coming after the elect. They're going to be coming after those who are Christians. And Jesus ends this passage with a really emphatic, but be on guard. I've told you all things beforehand, right? And this is kind of where we get our application out of this passage. Because, again, it's easy to look at these, and this is why last week, if you were here, like my, I fumbled over the application because I'm like, man, how do we apply these things when it's such a future time, what do we do now in light of what we know is coming? How, how do we apply this to a, a later time? So if Jesus says, well, I'm telling you all of this to warn you, um, but in spite of all of this that's coming, currently, presently, be on your guard. Right? Have your defenses up. Arm yourselves. Well, how do I do that, Jesus? You're telling me to arm myself, to be on guard, but how do I do that? And as I was thinking about that um, this week, I, I thought of the most obvious passage in my mind, at least, was Ephesians chapter 6. Right? Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, in verses 10 through 18, Jesus gives us a very clear way to arm ourselves and to, to, to be on guard for the attacks. Right? So if we go to flip over to Ephesians 6 um, with me, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, it'll be on the screen as well. But I want to kind of read this slowly and look at each aspect of what, of what Jesus says, all right? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. This is called the armor of God. You guys have probably heard this passage, okay, the armor of God. But when he says to guard yourself, to arm yourself, it's easy to say that and go, okay, you know, I'm ready and like, you know, put up your dukes. But how do we do that spiritually? How do I do that in such a way that I can be protected from the attempts of Satan? So let's read 6, 10 through 18. Finally... Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. All right, so stand strong. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. And to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we can only stand strong like Jesus is commending us to do because we have strength in the Lord. That's the only reason we can do it. We can't do it on our own. Our own strength will never be enough. We are weak. We are frail. But the Lord has infinite strength, strength that he has promised us and given us through the Holy Spirit. So, we hold tightly to the truths that we find in God's word. Let's walk through this uh, a little bit slower, okay? So if we go back to um, verse 14. Having fastened on the belt of truth, okay? So truth. We are, we are literally being held up by the belt of truth, the word of God, what we know to be true. We are standing firm in that. And then he says... Um, 
uh, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, right? We are, we are protected. Our hearts are protected but with the righteousness of Christ. We have been given the righteousness of Christ. We are in right standing with God, and, and now we are protected. Our hearts are protected. The Spirit indwells us, and so we put on this, this armor that will, will protect our hearts. And then it says to, um, and as shoes for your feet, put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So our, our shoes imply as we are going, right, where we're walking, where, where we go. So we are, we are taking the gospel with us where we go. We, we, have the, 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 we are ready to preach peace, the, pre, the peace that Christ has provided. And so we have the belt, we have the breastplate, we have our shoes, we are ready with the gospel. We are armed um, with God's word when we get to that. But our faith, right, our, our faith is um, the, the, um, the shield, right? Um, and, we, and we hold that and it ex- extinguishes any attack of the devil. We trust the Lord so intensely and so strongly that it's almost like he is protecting us from any attack. Like you can throw whatever you want at me, devil, but I believe that God is greater. I believe the words of God. I believe what God can do. So no matter what you throw at me and how you try to deceive me and what lies you try to whisper in my ear, I know the truth. So I'm going to stand in that and I'm going to hold fast this shield that protects me from any attack that you might bring my way. And we have faith in, in the God. I mean, all of these things, right? We're just arming ourselves with all of these, these things that the Lord has given us. And, and one day, as, as you know, we, we do this now and we fight now, one day we will have to fight, um, well, we may not have to, but there will be believers that will fight again in even more intense persecution and more attacks of the devil. But we, he says, stand firm and be on guard and, and be ready for those things, right? Um, and then Paul says to do what, right? We can have all these things. We can arm ourselves. We can hold the word up, we can have the gospel, you know, the gospel of the shoes, the whatever, but here's what he says at the end in verse 18. Pray at all times. So even if I have the word, even if I have faith, even if I have all of these things, um, Paul says you have to make sure that you are praying at all times. Why? Because being in communication with the Lord, being in constant contact with him is going to help remind you of these things. It's going to help keep you just just linked to him. When things come and, and you feel like you're drowning and you feel like you're wavering and you, 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 you can't feel like you know there's any hope and you can't see the light and all of those things, you keep the Lord close and he's going to pull you up and he's going to remind you of who he is. And so we're, we're constantly communicating and we're listening and, and we're doing this all the time in our lives. And with all of these tools that we have been given through Christ, we remain grounded in our faith and we remain in communication with the Lord. And then, I don't want to like say, I dare you, Satan, but like just watch Satan try to infiltrate our hearts and minds when we have the protection of the Holy Spirit that is just over our lives. And so what do we do? We live ready. We do that by equipping ourselves. We, li- we hope for eternity because we know that one day Jesus will come back. And we are driven by a sense of urgency in our lives. If we believe these things to be true, what Jesus says in Mark 13, we will live with a sense of urgency. If we read these passages and we're like, man, that's going to happen one day, and it could happen in our lifetime, like, yeah, there's got to be some things that happen, but it doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the next couple of years, and then Christ ushers in the end, like, that could happen in our life. What if there's neighbors, what if there's family members, what if there's people we really care about that don't know Jesus, and, and this time comes, right? There, there's got to be a sense of urgency in our lives, to take the gospel, to share the gospel, to talk about it with people as we are given opportunity to do that. We, we look for opportunity to do that. And so we live ready with this sense of urgency. I, I, I'm just reminded all the time of this. Like I, I, I drive a lot um, school and, you know, coffee shops and shopping. And I, I'm just driving all the time. Um, I feel like I spend half my life in a car, which is fine. But as I'm driving, like, I, I'm, 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 I think all the time. Jade will tell you this. We drove, we drove to Florida, and it's, well, like, 11 and a half hours, and I could sit in silence for 11 and a half hours, all right? It's kind of creepy. I could be that guy that, like, gets on an airplane with nothing and just, like, sits there for 10 hours because I just love thinking. And people around me are like, dude, that guy is weird. <laughs> Didn't even bring a backpack, right? But I just, I love just, like, thinking and praying and listening and just, like, observing and thinking about the world. And as I'm driving, like even just yesterday, I was driving, um, we were driving somewhere and I passed um, a Mormon temple and I'm just praying. Like I'm just praying as I pass that temple, just communicating with God about 
about deception and about like, you know, just using the gospel to twist um, into a faith that's not real and, and all of these things and I'm just so burdened by it, but does that drive me to a sense of urgency as I carry the gospel? What is my life for? I've said this before, but like what am I doing on this earth as a Christian if not carrying the gospel? What, what is my purpose? What am I doing? I'm not here just to like hang out and work and, you know, like raise children. That's not my purpose. While those are all kind of subsets of my purpose, like my purpose as a believer is to take the gospel and change the world with the gospel. That's my purpose. And if I'm not doing that on this earth, what am I doing? In fact, I say this and sometimes I hesitate to say it because I'm like, what if I'm not doing it well? I'm like, you know, God, take me home right now if I'm not doing this. Because what am I even doing here? And so we have to live with this sense of urgency if these things are true. And so that's kind of my encouragement to you. Now, we're going we're gonna to sing um, and then enter in a time of communion. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe you don't feel like you're ready. Maybe you don't feel like you are, you know, you're equipped. Maybe you don't feel strong in your faith. Maybe you don't feel like you have a, a really good connection with the Lord right now. Maybe you feel distant or disconnected. And maybe, maybe you feel like if some sort of persecution or oppression came in your life, you wouldn't be able to stand up to it. Maybe you, you feel like, man, I, I feel like I might, I might fall into that. I just don't feel strong in my walk right now. I don't feel like I'm, I'm really solid. I have solid ground right now. When we sing this song, like just cry out to the Lord and, and just say, God, I, I want to be strong in you. I, I want to rely on you. G- give, me, give me the motivation to do that. Give me the people in my life and hold me accountable to do that. Give me, give me purpose in my life. God, I, I want to I live for you. I want to live for this gospel. I want to be ready. And so, so use this, next, this, this song as we sing and as you're kind of praying and meditating just to, to, to call out to God and to listen to him. Allow the spirit just to, to speak to you. Maybe you don't feel like you have a sense of urgency. Maybe you do, do feel like, you know, I feel like I've just kind of fallen into this place of like, I'm, I'm kind of good in my life, and, and, I, and I go to work, and I come to church, and I go to small group, and I kind of do all the things, but I don't feel like that part of my life is really there, that part of my walk. I don't feel a sense of urgency. I don't feel like when I know I have unbelieving neighbors that I really have a responsibility to them, um, and, and Lord, I want that. I want that because I want people to know. I want them to have the opportunity. I want them to be able to, to at least respond to the gospel. To, to give them that choice and, and to, to give them that opportunity. But I don't feel like I have that sense of urgency. So maybe it's calling out to God and saying, God, I, I want that sense of urgency. I want to be used by you. I want to live on mission for you. So, so give me that sense of urgency through your Holy Spirit. And so this next, this next few minutes as we sing, just cry out to the Lord. Um, allow him to speak to you. Maybe it's just sitting in silence and let him speak. And let, let him just, just use his spirit just to speak to your heart and mind. But then um, at any point during the song when you feel like you're ready, like you've, you know, you've come before the Lord and you feel like you've just done what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do, um, just head back to those tables and grab the communion elements and bring them back to your um, seat. And then I'll be back up after the song to lead us in communion. Let me pray. God, thanks for um, this word. And thank you for um, even...